Hello, doggies. How y'all doing? You guys are barking up the right tree because this tree contains a couple branches and this particular branch is an episode of a comedy advice podcast. I guess in the metaphor, the full tree is a comedy advice podcast. I've got Christopher Titus as a guest today and he is a hilarious person. He's somebody that he just shelled out. It was like a machine gun of wisdom. He was like, dot, 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 stage time, dot, 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 dot. you got to get experience, dot, 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 dot. believe in yourself. And I was just, you know, filled with bullet holes of sage advice. And now I feel like the Swiss cheese of self-help. It's beautiful. I'm tasty. I have a little stink to me, but I think you guys are going to enjoy it because I've aged nicely. So um, he's also going to be in Phoenix this week. That's why I'm pumping out so many episodes. We've got just a gourmet charcuterie of comedy. We've got Christopher Titus, Pablo Francisco. Um, so go see him. Link is going to be in the show notes. See Christopher Titus. Just see him. I mean, go to his show. Don't just stare at him. Laugh and do all the comedy club procedural stuff. And if you guys haven't yet, get those tickets September 8th. I am going to be on my new show, Trash or Treasure with Lamar Mitchell Jr. We are going to be hosting a oh so delicious show where it's going to be a tournament style we're bringing up topics two comedians have to go head to head in each round to debate whether a certain topic is trash or treasure for example ironic star wars shirts trash or treasure i don't know millennium falcon trash or treasure i think that might be a good one but anyway the audience gets to decide who is the winner and who gets sudden death so there is a trap door. Don't tell the comedians and the loser just gets sucked down. And we do, we did, uh, thanks to the, all the support and, and, uh, the GoFundMe, we bought a rancor. So the rancor is going to be at the bottom and everybody gets to view the rancor devour the loser. It's going to be so good, but don't worry. I know a lot of PETA has come to us and they're like, is the rancor getting what it needs and deserves in terms of organic food? Don't worry. The rancor is actually on a field. It just goes under the stage for the show, but it is happy as a peach, as happy as a rancor peach. And it is, we leave it a little hungry. So it skips lunch that day because it's about to devour four comedians, five perhaps, but um, you know, it's going to be a good time. I feel like I spoke way too much about the rancor, but I know just in case anybody was worried, you feel like you got to cover that, you know? Um, but that's all guys. If you guys can support in any other way that you can think of, follow me on Instagram, support, follow, um, subscribe, leave a review, all that good stuff. Head on over to support town, love town. And give me some love. Because, oh, God, Love Town would be amazing, wouldn't it? It's not Paris. Paris is rat town because I feel like there are so many rats there. But they love each other, don't they? Isn't that the like, rat threesomes, the menage à trois, a rat, and all that good stuff? I don't know. But, yeah, if I was a rat, that's where I would be, Paris. If I was a desert rat, little kangaroo rat here in Phoenix, Arizona, I would want my boo to take me to Paris so that we could sip on the drips of wine coming from the people that have paid way too much money on the top of the Eiffel Tower and just eat that cheese from the garbage. It's probably the best. Garbage Paris cheese is probably better than gourmet Phoenix cheese. And that's a fact. That's <laughs> I'm coming in hot with my cheese takes here, okay? But there's going to be a lot more. We talk so much cheese, Christopher Titus and I. No, we don't. You'll find out right now because you're getting into the episode. So what are we doing on your podcast? So what do you you do? Explain your podcast to me so for everybody else too. Yes, yes. So for every, if this is your first time listening or your first time being a guest, how it goes is uh, we talk a little bit about Christopher Titus in this case, and then we get into the advice portion of the podcast. That's where okay. we've got questions from the Reddit advice column. Uh, we've got some inspirational quotes. We've got uh, positive spins on some bad things. And um, yeah, those are pretty much the segments. All right. I thought you have actual segments. I love that. Okay. Uh, so about me, <laughs> a little, little bit about Christopher Titus. Christopher Titus, uh, uh, yeah, if you know my comedy, I was raised by a mentally ill, mentally ill people and alcoholic people. Um, uh, one of them was both mentally ill and an alcoholic. Uh, the other one was an alcoholic and violent. Uh, turned out, I guess I turned out okay. Um, uh, but that's only because you can't see inside my soul. Uh, and then I, 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 
I have no other skills, so I started doing comedy. I literally started doing comedy at 17 years old. My first set was in my high school. Um, we did a senior follies, and I'd never done comedy before in a sense that, like, no one knew I had this, like, oh, I wanted to. So mm -hmm. it was very, it was, people were like, this is going to suck. They were like, they were couldn't wait for me to tank it. And I, I wrote jokes about all the teachers, slammed them, wrote jokes about my friends. And then at the end of it, we actually... Tr we did, and and I was in in the auditorium, and I'm just beating on the teachers. I I was a senior. I was done. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Get rid of me now? <laughs> and then at the end, I had a a buddy of mine. We trashed a freshman. My last bit, my closing, my first set of my closing bit was, we drug. We actually had a volunteer freshman who we had hogtied him, and we drug him on stage as as a volunteer, and then explained to the juniors who are coming in as seniors how to trash can a freshman. Then we proceeded to actually trash can the kid on stage and left him with his feet sticking out and just walked off and let the garbage can set on stage. <laughs> and so that was my first set. And I got and when I got done, people were like, dude, we didn't none of us even knew you wanted to do comedy. You just you're just a douchebag in class. And and uh so I that's that was my first set. Then I didn't do comedy again till probably two years later, two and a half years later, nineteen, and that was it. And then from from then on it's just Dang. been suffering and pain. Now this this is why I I was gonna say adore you, but I don't know if that's a weird word to say. But this is that's, why I look dude, up to you. You know, man, it's it's twenty twenty one. We're dudes. I adore you too. We can say that. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> but I'm I really this I'm is fine with it. <laughs> and this is I why may, I, I may cherish you. I may even cherish you. If you adore me, I, I may cherish you. That's how my that works. I was I was about to slip out the C word for you too. I cherish <laughs> you too, Christopher. And, and it's it, what I really respect about you too is the fact that you went out, you um, just trashed all the all the teachers. I feel like I in that scenario I would probably be the freshman. And I'd be like, okay, yeah, you guys, that's fine. You want to tie me up? Maybe we can hang out later. And you guys would be like, uh, no, yeah. we're leaving you on stage. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> be, being able to just tell it like it is and just hearing you on, I know that when you ended up doing, um, well, your what I think you're on your 10th special now, your new tour, Zero Side Effects. Yeah, my 10th special. Uh, zero Side Effects is, is uh, uh, yeah, it's 10th special. Uh, if you, by the way, uh, if you want to come see me in Phoenix, uh, anybody who's listening, uh, and you're a white supremacist or you're an anti-vaxxer, you probably shouldn't come. Uh, I have two, I have, I have, I have two bits that are about probably eight minutes long a piece that pretty much shreds it in a way that I don't think anybody has yet and, uh, shreds both of those things pretty hard. And, uh, to the point where. We had a guy, and I did it. So my, my agent booked me on this tour. Arkansas, it was Texas, Arkansas, <laughs> Ohio, and Missouri. And I'm like, what the, f are you trying to, what did you guys take a life insurance policy out on me? I'm on the COVID forever <laughs> tour. So, so we're in Arkansas one night and it's this little club, but for whatever reason, the guy used to be a giant executive at Walmart. So he's got money. So like this little 140 seat club, he's bringing in like, like Rob Schneider. He's right. Yeah. You know, I got to go. He, he, the list was like, how the hell are these guys even, come? they can't make money on this, but the guy's got money. So he just, whatever that is, whatever that is. And then I'm doing this bit about, uh, I do, I run the COVID conspiracy. I run the whole vaccine conspiracy about a chip in you and about a, you know, and about uh, it's going to control you. And this uh -huh. dude in the back of the room, I get to it's an eight minute bit where I just prove because no one thinks beyond oh, is it controlling you. Oh, OK. So how is that going to work? There's a chip that, that would have to be so high tech. We'd have to bring Steve Jobs back from the fucking dead to make it work. And then it, they inject in your body. Somehow it finds your nervous system, hooks out its robot nano arms like like Dr. Octopus from Spider-Man. And we can all agree that superhero names suck. He's got 12 arms. He's a doctor, yeah. Dr. Octopus. Oh, he's silver and he surfs, silver surfer. Uh, he's a he's a man, but he dressed like a bat. That's a tough one. Like I anyway. So I do something. But anyway, so I do the bit. And at the end of the yeah. bit, the audience is roaring. This one big dude, big redneck dude, stands up in the back, goes to the owner and goes, I'm tired of listening to this shit. And I, just, I just totally destroyed his entire breakdown of how the chip would control you. And I can live with that heckle. You know, I always think if I'm not walking one or two people a week, you know, on a really good show uh, and a good, really good set when I'm really pushing it right, when I'm hitting the right buttons, two, two people a night, I'm, I'm okay with. 
out of you know, an audience of 400, if two people get up pissed and walk out, that means I'm bumping up against it. I'm just bumping up against the, you know, the right amount. You know, even better, you might be saving lives. Maybe that gentleman went home that night, pondered his whole existence, life, what he was doing, and maybe he got vaxxed the next day. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because when when you I have I have do you have any smart friends? Like I have friends that I consider or I considered smart, and they're like I just got one from a, a, the other day. He's got a, makes a lot of money, great business, and he was just like he's like yeah, man. He goes the, the shit you're spewing right now. You might as well be reporting for CNN and MSNBC. And I'm like I, I'm 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 just reporting facts and shit. like i always say fact me or fuck off you can say he goes oh yeah right the government's just just uh, totally nice and they love you is that your fucking argument right there is that your whole fucking argument so I, i'm kind of i'm kind of a dickhead about it i, I guess i really as i as i've gotten older i've really accessed and 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 embraced my inner asshole <laughs> I feel, I mean, I feel throughout your, um, this is me saying you've been an asshole all along, Christopher, but I, I think uh, that, Thank you. Th no, I'm fine I, with that. I, I think that you've been, and I like to surround myself with people that are blunt and straight to the point, because that way there's no sugarcoating things. I know where I stand with that person and I feel like, right. okay. Uh, and my wife, same way. She's very blunt. She tell if she doesn't agree with something or feels like something is, is wrong, then she'll tell me. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't have to guess why I'm mad anymore. So, or why you're mad right. anymore. So it's, I, it's. I have one of those. I have one of those too. I have a good wife. I have. I have one that will just flat out stop. Stop. What did you just say? And then I'm like, oh fuck. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I like those women. I, I like those women. Uh, my wife calls them Alpha Chick. She's a comic too. She does a she does a special called Alpha Chick where she talks about how women women like that run the world. You know. Mm, yes. Yes. That my favorite type of women. That's strange to say, but I I think that it, your wife also. I was going to ask this because you um, you guys do the podcast together. The, uh, the right. Christopher Titus podcast, and you also yep. she's your goes on tour with you as the opening act. Yes, yeah, yes, she, yeah, she, she. Well, here's the thing: is that's such a weird thing, and we there's a couple of uh, comics that have done that, and we know, and she booked comedy clubs for six years, so she okay, okay. kind of she knew she she knew and knows everybody because she booked them. She booked six different funny bones, and she would travel wow. around all the time, and. And so when I showed up at a club, my, my marriage was, was done and, and I was not in a mm -hmm. good way. And for whatever reason, we hit it off. And then she started, so we, we, we kind of fell in love. We fell in love pretty hard. Uh, you're, yeah, I, so I told her one day, I go, boy, your second marriage is the best. And she looks at me and she goes, yeah, you're my first. Can't wait to my second one. That's, how, that's who she is. <laughs> that, that's, who, that's who she is. So... Uh, she started giving me jokes. I was I was writing Love is Evil at the time because of my divorce, and she was the other mm -hmm. half of Love is Evil, my new girlfriend. And she started mm -hmm. going, what if you said this? And she started giving me these really fucking solid jokes. And it was kind of annoying because I've been doing comedy since I was a kid. And I'm like, you shouldn't just be able to fucking be tossing shit off to me. Like it's, and it's as good as, or better than I would write sometimes. And so I started, yeah, I just, yeah. she did that for a while. And I, and I finally said, listen, uh, you need to write your own show. And so she started writing comedy and then she wouldn't get on stage. And and she hates when I tell mm. the story, but it's true. I, do, I can't tell, listen, if you say I'm gonna be a comedian and you'll never get on stage, you're not backing yourself up. And if we're in a relationship, how can you, how can you back me up if you won't even back yourself up? So uh, being the AML, I am my editor in a, I ended her in a comedy competition and then I told her. <laughs> I entered her first, and then I came home and told her. And she was, dude, you want to talk about a fight? Holy shit. She was like, what? You can't enter me in a motherfucking comedy competition? I decide when I'm going to go. Oh, when I'm ready, I'll do it. And then we were arguing, and she goes, when is it? And that's when I knew I had her. Ah, when is it? You said, when is it? So, and then, and she came in second, which is weird. First time, first time ever on stage. But she had six wow. years of comedy background and seeing what worked and watching other comics. So, and she's an English major, so, and she's funny. So, and and so she's she's got ten years in now. She's she's earned her stripes, man. She really has. Wow, wow. And she, I mean, just hearing her on the podcast too. She's 
absolutely hilarious. Has these really um, unique yes. points of view, these hard punch lines. So it's it, uh, the, that's she's very talented. She's very talented. She's beautiful and brutal. Yes, she's beautiful and brutal. <laughs> I would agree with that. I would agree with that. How, now, how having two of the same type of people in the same profession in a relationship does do you guys? bump heads a lot if you give her any advice or give her any tips or just it sounds like she gives you some and it's a little irritating sometimes um you know as weird as when she was coming up you know you, you don't you people always say like how do you become a comedian just tell me the rules and she would say that and i'd be like stage time and she'd be like no no no, no. you know how to you've done this for a long time how do i get to it how do i get better faster and I said, stage time. You already got the joke. She did this bit when her first, uh, the first thing she did, she had a, she went to a hardcore Christian elementary school, and the, and the whole premise for the bit is, uh, our our principal used to do assemblies nailed to a cross. That's and, and she's doing a school assembly, and it's dude, for for a new comic to that's how she thinks. So she's brand new. She hasn't done comedy yet. And she wrote that bit. And I watched her do it the first night when she came in second, and and the bit kind of didn't do well. And she's doing she's doing Jesus, but as she starts like losing faith in the bit, uh, well, ironically, her arms start <laughs> dropping, and she ended up kind of low five Jesus at the end. It was like she was just like way down here, and and she gets off stage. She goes she goes the Jesus bit. I'm not going to do it anymore. It doesn't work. And I said I said no no no. I said no. You're not. You don't know what you're doing yet. I go that premise is so mm. far beyond. Your writing is so far beyond what you how you what you know how to pull off right now. Just just put it away, put it away, give it two years, and then try it again. And she did it. End up in her special, and we use lighting and stuff. And it's one of her best bits. But she wrote so far ahead of her performing ability. So so she's been doing comedy ten years now. And she came to me. We were just kind of hanging out at a club. And she gets off. She she blows the roof off one night. And and uh, she's always funny. But you have, we all have great. When you have a great set, she was like, <gasps> and she and she said, I knew what I was doing every minute. Like when they laughed, I knew what was coming next. I knew the timing. And then she goes, stage time. And I go, ah, that's stage time. So I can I can give you all the advice in the world, any great comic. And I and I got it too, man. When I started, Kevin Nealon gave me advice. Dana Carvey gave me advice. Um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Kevin mm -hmm. Rooney uh, gave me gave me all the advice that Leno gave him. And mm -hmm. until you until you're on that stage four or five years and you're and you've played the shittiest gigs you've ever played and you've played some good gigs and you've done shitty christmas parties which i got a story about one of those man um yeah yeah and i because I, I sometimes i learned by bad example sometimes i learned watching a guy who i open for just motherfuck a crowd where you're like oh well, i'm never doing that holy shit <laughs> It was a guy named uh, Kip Adada years ago. I did a uh, I did a Christmas party, and I and it was like Christmas parties are great in college because it's more money than you've seen, and so and it was only like at that time yeah. three hundred bucks, which is like holy shit! Like I was so stoked because um, open mics don't pay anything, and uh, I do this Christmas party, and I'll never forget it. I don't know why this is seared in my memory. There was a company that made uh -huh. boxes. The club, the the guy who owned the company was named Butch Flash, and I started doing it. It was a long time ago in the '80s, so I was doing Butch Flash PI, and I was making. But there was a bunch of people that worked in the warehouse that were Haitian, and they were sitting in the back of the room, and they were talking. But I just did my show. It's a Christmas party. Even then, I knew that in a Christmas party, everybody knows each other. You, it's not like a like a comedy club where you can just turn to a heckler and just fucking nail them because everybody knows that's Phil. I have lunch with Phil. He, you know, he, yeah. he him and I worked together. So people get weird. So I get done with my set, do fine, do very well. Kipadotti gets on stage, and these Haitian people who don't speak English are sitting in the back of the room talking amongst themselves. And Kipadotti just goes, hey, hey, do you know why I don't speak in a comedy show? Because I know what could happen. Pool cue across the bridge of the nose. That's what could happen. And it didn't go well. The audience just kind of like, what the fuck is going on? And then, <laughs> so they don't, they don't speak English. They the, all they know is there's a white guy on stage loud and they he they don't even know he's talking to them, so he goes on for a little more. Five minutes later, he just go he just what he says. He turns and he goes, "Hey, gooks," and I just oh. went, "Oh my god, <laughs> yeah." And by the way, <laughs> and I was like, "Oh no!" And and the whole place just went just shrunk and I, everybody's just like, "What the fuck?" And he tanked it for the next maybe twenty minutes. Oh, gets off no. stage, 
grabs his check. Two guys meet him, and they went and got blow. He said, we're going to go get blow. You want some? What am, I'm like, at the time, I'm like 19. No, I'm good. I'm fine. <laughs> but I, I'll never, I'll, I'll never... I'll never forget that moment where, as a comic man, you have to be able to read what's going on. And he had been doing comedy forever. That he was that pissy about that was just weird. But yeah, hmm. so I, anyway, I don't know. I told, I don't want to tell you the story. I you just so stage time. So I got to watch other guys do bad things. I also saw Dana Carvey. Dana Carvey gave me the best piece of comedy advice ever. He said, "You hmm. have to learn to tell, you have to learn to tell the same story again for the first time." Oh, that's great advice. Oh. Yeah, you have to learn to tell the same story again for the first time. And I remember thinking, holy shit, because that's what you have to do. Yeah, and that's when that's when you know you got to write new material. Like I'll do a – that's why I'm on my 10th special because I, I can't – now I'm to this I've, – I've screwed myself. I can't – I used to be able to do an act for six years. I can't do it anymore. Mm. At, at two years, it's done. If, at a year and a half, it's done. If I don't film it by then, I, I start to my brain start. I, look, my self hatred is pretty deep, but it really gets <laughs> amplified at a year and a half if I've done the same act. Um, <laughs> so and, and so, but I would watch Carvey do seven shows a week. You know, because you know, before he got Saturday Night Live, I got to work with him. When, when I got to open for him, and I'd watch this guy do seven shows. And same material, but he would find a new way. And I laughed every time because he found a way to tell the same story again for the first time. That is really interesting. And it kind of connects some dots, too. I was listening to some interviews where you were talking about, um, I think, even writing on Titus, where some of the writers were like, we've got some we've got funny jokes for this. And you're like, can we make them funnier? And they're like, no, they're, they're funny. And you're like, well, let's make them funnier. Let's see how we can keep yeah. improving. And so it, it's really cool because if you are able to tell that story like it was the first time you told it, the audience really feels that. They connect to it and they, they go, yeah. oh my gosh. It's It kind of helps people because I think a lot of people still think that comedians are just on their specials. That's the first time they told that. They're just talking. Right, yeah. And, and I think that's right. a good um, hint. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, no, no, I might interrupt you. Uh, Titus was weird because and, and the writers from things. So the reason I got I got Titus, the reason we did it the way we did it, I hate sitcoms. I hated I hated what sitcoms were. I mean, there's so many great ones now because everybody mm -hmm. the form got kind of blown apart. Uh, and I, mm -hmm. I think we were part of that. Malcolm in the Middle was part of that, of where it wasn't just, you know, Grace Under Fire or just this, this exact kind of box that sitcoms were in. And we taken the form and, and Malcolm in the Middle did it and a couple other places did it. Um, but but we'd sit in the room and they would write a sitcom. Someone would pitch a sitcom -y joke. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I would say, OK, I would say, that's funny. What's funnier? And they would kind of all look at me and they got in the habit of knowing because uh, what would happen is look, we have 14 funny people in this room. OK, that's a good joke. Let's top it three times. And then we and then we'd always find something. And Jack Kenny and Brian Hargo were just great, great, you know, co-executive producers. They were just my partners with me and they were awesome. And mm -hmm. they they would be like, OK. And then everybody got in the habit of it at where what like after the first maybe four episodes, people realized that I was going to say what's funnier. And and, you know, at, at, at first it was like, fuck. You know, uh, and those guys, the guy, those guys that stayed with that attitude didn't last. But the guys that did, man, we all we, we amped it up. We amped it up and kept going. We had to fight the network a lot, a lot of stuff, you know. Mm. Uh, and then mm -hmm. once the second year, third year, when they, we got past, like they knew we were going to do something weird, like do an intervention to get my dad drinking again. Or we were going to do a heart attack <laughs> episode. Once they realized after 20 or 30 of those that they were like, well, fuck. Then they were then we had the weird. Oh, God, I think I might have told this story before. We had one executive uh -huh. come in, and this was a serious episode where my dad had a heart attack, and he went through the light to the fucking heaven, and we mm -hmm. kept waiting for them to shut it down. Religious imagery. And he kept saying, you're in the Bahamas, right? Is Cynthia wearing a bikini? Um, do me a favor. Give me some of the – I want to see the bikinis you guys are going to use so I can make sure we get the right size so we can go as small as we can for standards and practices. And I was like, is that the note? And they were like, yeah. Okay, fuck. <laughs> and that's why it's hard <laughs> to take them serious. 
But <laughs> it's just a hard. Sometimes it's hard to take. You know, I get why. I think writers and executives have this. That are always going to have this because right. An executive usually was an attorney. We worked his way up to an assistant, and it's rare. I have found that it's rare that you get a very, a really creative executive. Doug Herzog is one. John Landgraf is one. Um, mm-hmm. There's some really mm-hmm. great guys. Uh, um, Dana Walden, who's in charge of uh, twenty at uh, Disney now, she's uh, she's creative. But there's so many of them that are just, it you know, they're just keep. Give me what I've seen before, except different. What? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they say shit like that, and you're like, yeah, no, we have something like that. Uh, I want it just like that, except put an Asian guy in it. Is that the whole? It's it's a story. Okay, is, uh, got it. So I uh, uh, and and I've I've made them mad, but there's some, there's some good ones. I think it's changed a little bit. I think with all the production, I think creativity has to be part of being an executive now. I think so. I could be wrong. Yeah. I'll know what this new yeah. this new sitcom I'm writing. <laughs> nice. Nice. And um I I was gonna say too, I, I think I remember hearing that story on one of the interviews that you did where you were talking about your, your dad gets a heart attack. He goes to the pearly gates of heaven and then everyone's had yeah. the had the lights off and they're like, No, we're not here and he's pounding on it and everything. So it's really funny yeah. that, that Jesus is Jesus is, brought up Jesus is brought up bikini. Bikini. Okay. That happened all the time. I tell that story because that was the bit. That was the one. I, I, I'm not this way anymore. I would be very frustrated. It's it's so hard to write a bad sitcom or a bad script. It's fucking hard. You have to figure out story. You have to. The characters have to have a through line that matches. You. I mean, it's hard. You can't just throw fucking random jokes in that a character wouldn't say. You have to figure out what that character is going to say. And so we mm-hmm, would stay up mm-hmm. till midnight every night, midnight of every night in the writer's room, you know, writing, trying to break stories and make it work. And then some guy w- who just saw us fucking walk through it on a stage would just go, you know, man, I didn't think the second act really worked. Well, yeah, because fucking we were reading. I mean, it's it, you just it would frustrate me. And when when that was the note, after all my paranoia about getting this episode shut down because my dad did my dad we took me to the Bah. it was it was two stories my dad had, had four heart attacks he also took me to the bahamas where we were supposed to get along so and we didn't and so that was the basis for that real story uh the real basis for that story and when this guy said can i see cynthia's bikini i literally had fucking fury come up in me man i was like i tell the story like it's funny but i'll never forget we walked out of the notes meeting and I went, that motherfucker, are you serious? Like all the shit we're doing, all the shit they complain about. And this episode's way worse than shit we've ever done. And this motherfucker wants to see Cynthia's bikini. He wanted to see it in his office. I want to see it. I want to be able to prove it. Uh, okay, <laughs> weirdo, fuck. Oh Sorry, God. I just get. By the way, there was a bunch of stories like that. You know, I, the dumbest thing I ever yeah. did. I t- did. Did I? Did you hear the, the the David Hyde Pierce story? The thing I did with David Hyde Pierce. No, no, I didn't. David hear Hyde that Pierce one. guessed it on the show. Here's the arrogance of television and being a star of a TV show where people are up your ass all the time. So um, Brian had a connection to David Hyde Pierce, uh, and David Hyde Pierce is the nicest guy. He'd already won like he he was on his 900th Emmy. Or shit. I mean, he, mm-hmm. they were like, they were just mm-hmm. sending him Emmys now. They weren't even, they were like, yeah, we're not nominated. We're just going to give you one every year now from now on. And he agreed to do this, sh- to do Titus. And he agreed to do an episode called, um, uh, it was the, the seminar or whatever it was. And he played the seminar mm-hmm. leader. He was fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. And here's how arrogant and lost I was in how, because we were working so hard. He's doing the bit and he's doing David. It's fucking David Hyde Pierce. It's David Hyde Pierce. And he's doing this character the way he, and I'm like, you know what, man? I always thought, saw the character like this. And he's like, yeah, okay. I, I hear, I see that. He goes, but I, this is the way I see it. I want to do it. I'm like, wait, wait, the character we wrote, but, and I started arguing me, no fucking actor guy, guy who fucking tells jokes to drunk people in a fucking nightmare redneck bar is giving David Hyde Pierce fucking acting lessons. I'm sitting there giving him fucking notes. And all of a sudden, I, I, I David I Pierce, and by the way, he's the nicest guy. He like anybody else would have just went, hey dude, shut the fuck up. You're lucky I'm on this show. If I, you know, <laughs> David David Hyde Pierce didn't do that. He just goes, he goes, you know what, man? He goes, I, I'm gonna kind of work on it my way. And and then I heard me talking to this motherfucking badass, probably one of the best comic actors we've ever produced in America. And I went, 
I, I literally had I got cold and sweaty, and I went, "I'm sorry. Oh my God, no. Okay, I'm <laughs> David. I'm sorry." I, and I go, and I said, "I can't even believe I was giving you advice. Oh my God, I'm so sorry." And he goes, "No, it's okay. No, I go, no, it's not. You're David Hyde Pierce." And I walked away. And I, I think I annoyed him because I apologized to him for the rest of the shoot. He was there that whole week, and I just every day I go, "David, I'm sorry. You're, I'm the dumbest man in the world giving you advice." <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine walking up to just pick an actor. Hey, Denzel, uh, you know the way you're doing that scene? Yeah, I got a note for you. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you, ima- you imagine the sack you'd have to have? And, and, and that's what I had at one point. So I, I was a little bit I, – I'm, I'm, I'm much better now. I, I was so burnt out. That show burnt me out really bad. But, but that's why I do comedy so well because I, I – a lot of guys get a show or they get a bunch of commercials or whatever, and they think, I made it, I'm done. But show business takes you 15 years to even get close to it. And then it takes, mm-hmm. and then when you get something, it takes 15 seconds to lose it. They literally mm. pick up the phone and they go, sorry, we're canceling it. Click. That's how fast it is. So uh, I've had friends that have got stuff since Titus, and I learned that lesson. And I always tell them, I go, are you looking around? Are you noticing? And they go, what? I go, are, you go I'm tired. I'm being, they're beating my ass. Are you noticing it though? Are you noticing that they send a car to pick you up? Are you noticing that if you need to fly across the country, they put you on a private? I mean, are you noticing? Notice it because it's gonna go fucking like that. What a way to practice mindfulness. That's. Man. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I had to lose. I had to lose my own television show to learn it. It was a very expensive lesson. Very oh, expensive. No. Oh, but I did learn it. No. Oh, man. Well, this has been a fantastic set of advice. And we're going to just jump into the segments that we sure, got, segments. Christopher. This, this first one, it's, uh, well, I like to juice us up and inspire us with an inspirational quote. So I've got one here. But I like to ask my guests, just in case you've got any inspirational quotes to kind of pick you up when, you know, a TV, your TV show gets canceled or um, something bad happens to you. Do you have any inspirational quotes? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, too soon. Uh, go ahead. Give me yours. Give me yours. Give me the one you got, and we'll do mine. Uh, all right. Well, I'll give you this one. This one I didn't find okay. by any person. It's actually by a robot, and it's called – it's the chip inside the Pfizer vaccine. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it's by a robot <laughs> called Inspirobot. So it uses AI to take the wisest words known to man, and it just scrambles them all together and makes an inspirational oh. quote. Oh, no. I can't wait. So, so I, I just clicked and it generated one for me. I'll go ahead and read it. You can tell me what okay. it, it means to you. Um, okay. This week, Inspirebot says, attorney is pretty much just another word for a person who's in desperate need of love. Wow. Uh, I had five attorneys in my divorce, and uh, I think they're in need of... <laughs> What Novichok? Uh, that stuff that Putin <laughs> gave to those people. Every attorney, every attorney I have met should have a Novichok cupcake. Is all I'm gonna say. It's I, not as inspired. I know it's not an inspiring quote, but that's how I feel about attorneys. <laughs> that's how. Um, that's you know, it's that's funny, totally I, fair. Uh, I've written some quotes that for my sh- for my shows that ended up coming out of my brain. Uh, they'll be normal and the crowd will accept you. Be deranged and they'll make you their leader. Uh, I didn't mean it like what happened in the last four years. I meant that I find that the people that you're like, what the fuck is that guy doing? Five years later, that guy, you're like, that guy's a genius. You know, I, I, I find that the yeah. people that are a little nutty are, are usually if they're trying to do something that you haven't seen before. I would say uh, Maria Bamford. There's comics that I just go, wow. There's people I watch where I'm like, yeah. I will, n- I will never be that. I am good at what I'm. I want to be the Bruce Springsteen of comedy in a sense that I'm just, I just keep, I, I'll keep putting it out. Let's go, fuckers. Another album. Let's go. Uh, um, but yeah, I, I, I be deranged, be deranged, be, be, you know, be deranged because people will make you their leader. All of a sudden, they'll all turn to you, and uh, and it's, and I just wish it didn't work. Like with Trump too. Fuck, that was he was deranged, and they followed him. <laughs> Did you see that? Yeah. Like, there was a like, fight over masks. There was a fight over a mask at a school. Like they had a school meeting about they no. were, they wanted to mandate masks, and the the, the anti mask people 
who have kids, by the way, followed the other people out to their cars and were threatening to kill them. Oh my God! No way. Yeah, yeah I was listening to the video. We are we are in a, we are in a great place in America. It's it's awesome. It's it's I'm uh, so inspiring quotes. Let's do those. <laughs> Uh, 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 let's do those i feel you know i uh, feel um i feel sadder now but it's it's yeah, uh, no. well the it's... new show listen i got something i had a near death. my new show is about a new i had i had a near-death experience in my new show and some of the one of the one of the quotes in the show is that uh nobody's nobody's ever gonna remember you ever i mean so why not just why not just have fun here you're do you you get that there's eight billion people that died before we were here and we don't remember any of them the guy that invented socks that's an important guy uh the hot shower guy do you, who, doesn't that guy need a statue like we got a statue of a fake actor in philadelphia but the guy who invented the hot shower that fucking guy you know i know ashton kutcher wouldn't go see the statue <laughs> That's that's right. That what is that with all these celebrities now that are coming out where I will, they don't I was, they don't I, I tweeted I tweeted that out. I want to be so famous and confident and have so much self esteem. I just randomly think it's okay to TV. Oh, by the way, like I don't clean myself. <laughs> <laughs> she almost vomited. I don't clean myself. Eh, you know, because my skin likes the natural scuzziness of my filth. Eh, I don't clean myself. What the fuck? Is it like extra, I, I literally uh, read it when, yeah, I went, what the fuck? I mean, what the fuck? What? That's what, yeah, that's what I was Jake reading. Jake Gyllenhaal. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jake Gyllenhaal jumps on board. Is this a thing now? Is, is it the, what is it, the stink challenge? What are we doing? Who are we, are we what disease are we curing? Why, why is everybody I, jumping on board? I don't know what I'm going. I don't know I don't where I'm know. going with this. Go ahead, keep your segments no, going. No, no, sorry. No, that's that's okay. That's okay. Maybe maybe that's the secret to success is just if you save that time on the shower. Although that's where I thought that you get most of your brilliant ideas. Just I mean, in general, exactly. that's where that's where they come to me. I, I actually read a book, uh, and I because I suck at math, so it was to get better at math. But it was actually. Right? talking about how your brain works wait and... you you read oh you read to get better at math that doesn't make a lot of sense to me but okay <laughs> i know see this is where the I, stage i'm working on principle... the saxophone because i really because i want to learn how to play guitar what <laughs> Go ahead. no you're right it's the stage time i need to do that math to get better at it but i was like i'll just Good. read about it but but the book it, it it talked about how your mind works and how when you have really complex problems whether it be math or otherwise if you take a break and you start doing something else your mind will still be thinking of that and that's why this is yep. strange to relate to like movies and tv shows but a detective will be thinking of something and then they'll be like oh the sandwich the murderer used the sandwich and then they'll right. they'll crack the case or something like that so the shower that's when so, you feel more relaxed yeah and that works for comedy you know you've do you know how, how long have you done comedy for uh about three years okay yeah. you ever notice that you'll be on a long trip driving and all and you'll be just driving and you'll think of you'll be like oh fuck, that's a bit you, you, yes. and you, you ever, or, or, or in the shower or so I always tell comics when they go how do you write 10 specials like how do you write 10 90 minute specials and the part of it is you have to sit in Leno I, this is kind of a modification of what Leno said a long time ago it's like working mm -hmm. out you got to write all the time because then the jokes come faster you you can pick heavier weights up you can come up with new concepts but the reason but most guys sit down and we're in a room by ourselves and we try to write jokes, and if we don't write something funny in five minutes, we're like, fuck, I'm not doing this, I suck, I'm not doing this, and, you, and we push it aside, right? Well, here's why. Yes. We live in a, we live in a very a linear world, a very structured world, bills, and I have to be here at a certain time, and I gotta call that guy, and I gotta do this podcast that I fucked up before, and, and so <laughs> we live in a very uncreative, blocky, right angle world. To write comedy, you have to connect the thinnest threads to two idea, two like disparate ideas. So, and the only way that happens is through creativity. But if you're living in the linear mind, you can't you can't do it. So, how you get out of the linear mind is also musical. Do it too. You have to write, and this is the number I'm going to use until you get to. It'll get faster. 
if you write get right shit for 35 minutes just shit don't don't judge it just like whatever's coming out just let it go and even if you hate it you know just deal with that tumor that you're growing on your soul and just keep going <laughs> and i guarantee you right around 35 minutes you will write a joke that you like and then don't stop because now you're open so now you can you know write another hour and you're good but it takes about 35 minutes and again the more you do it the more it increase like when i when i sit down and write a new show I'll get the beginning I the beginning bit and the ending bit and I'll kind of know what it's about and I'll have just have a list of things and I just start writing and usually the first things I write they're shitty they're really shitty and mm -hmm. I just keep going mm -hmm. and keep going and keep going and keep going and about 35 40 minutes in man I just start pumping out jokes and and it's you have to switch your brain you have to switch your brain. And, and nothing makes me madder than when I'm in that and someone comes in and goes uh my wife will come in and be like did you see this the 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 the, the fucking power bill this month I'm like you just fucking everything up you just you just downshifted into reality and don't let me do that let me keep doing here so um that when you were talking about how how you write uh, you the shower is a great place because your mind just wanders you're you're being you're just not in the linear world and that's you have to get out. the only way you can write good comedy or write i think write well at all is to get out of the linear world and it takes a couple of minutes it takes some minutes man I, you just have to go i'm going to write sh and give yourself permission to suck you have to give yourself permission when you start writing i'm going to write shit, and then just write shit, and eventually jokes will come out of it but we all oh sit in a room God. by ourselves like, holy shit, man, I'm not funny anymore. No one knows, dude. You're by yourself. It's okay. Just keep writing. You'll be funny. We'll fix it. It'll be good. <laughs> that is, I just want to soak that advice in because I feel like it's so valuable. I feel like we constantly attack the stuff that we're writing when we're in that like initial five minutes. And I think if you get in the mm -hmm. flow and you're just like, you know what, just power through it you can fix yeah. it later right now you're just kind of tracing out the marble and then you can kind of chisel it um later so yeah i think pu i puke it out I, I, I yeah exactly so i think next writing sesh i'm gonna actually lay down in my shower and then start writing for <laughs> ultimate <laughs> in the car i'm gonna take a shower in my car well you know it's a tesla so i'm gonna let it drive itself i'm gonna be so fucking creative I'm going to be the Beatles of comedy. That's how good I'm going to be. I know I know that we just uh, we talked about hot shower guy, but hot shower in Tesla guy is going to he's going to get a statue for sure. That Whoever guy. That. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> guy's oh, amazing. man. Well, Musk is in that bar. by the way, be deranged. I told you, be deranged. If you be normal, the crowd will accept you. Be deranged and they'll make you their leader. He is insane and he's making every, he's the leader. I love it. I, by the way, I love it. I'm just I'm just I'm I'm just Yoda. I think. All right, guys. <laughs> well, more um, segments. We've... God damn it! <laughs> we've, got, we've got a question here from the Reddit advice okay. column, and so this random sure. user says, "My girlfriend gets upset when I don't want to kiss. Literally, just that. She gets upset. She will stop cuddling with me. She won't watch TikTok with me, and then won't kiss me even thirty minutes later." We've had issues with her getting upset when I've said no to things in the past before. I don't want to break up with her. We've been friends for years and dated almost a year now. She's been there for me, and I don't know what to do without her. But I can't keep dealing with this. Thank you. That okay? What do you think about that? as a as a? I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna take an old school dude approach to this. Your 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 girlfriend wants to kiss you, and you say no. The fuck is wrong with you, dude? <laughs> I mean, I have a wife, man. I'm my second wife. Uh, let me explain how this. There's gonna be a day you look back and go, man, that girl wanted to kiss me all the time, and now this girl I'm with right now, she's taking my kids and wants a divorce. So how about you just kiss the girl, uh, and if it's a halitosis issue, get her some, get her on a dental plan or something. But help her. But what are you doing, bro? Is that really? Is that your? I had a woman. I had a divorce. <laughs> She was fucking two other guys. <laughs> I oh, paid no. for her boob job, and she took my and she told she f took my kids. So oh. I would say, uh, kiss your girlfriend, asshole. Kiss Sorry, kiss Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> not, to a, not, not to be a dick, 
But really, is that your is that your issue? Okay. That's. I wish I lived in the world that this guy did, where that's his biggest problem. And and <laughs> right. I, I, I've been married for eight years. I mean, I'm on a kissing <laughs> famine right now. I will take whatever exactly. I can get. We, we oh, live in the fuck. Ethiopia of kissing, motherfucker, and you <laughs> and you are bitching about it. Wow. Oh, oh God. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, maybe, maybe wrong question to ask this crowd right here. <laughs> yeah, we, exactly. It's st- <laughs> stirred up some emotions for us. Uh, All right. Uh, All right. Um, well, we, we, we've got this. Uh, oh, we've uh, we've kind of gone over time here. So we can cut this at an end right here, right now. Christopher, thank you so I much. Am very, I have to, do I have to go. All right. I am very uh, I'm very talky. Sorry. Oh no! I enjoyed all of the talkiness. It's been a pleasure, and I feel like I, I've, I've we've been able to shuck some comedy pearls from, from yes, you. There we have. I mean, you you are so. Wow, well, you mix your metaphors. The... Would you shuck pearls? You usually mix comedy metaphors like crazy. You shuck pearls. Yeah. Wow. I don't, wait. How do you wait? You oh, you shuck oysters and then get the pearls. There we go. Right. Oh, is it shuck? I thought you. Sh- I thought you shucked corn. I didn't know you sh- you shuck oysters too. Oh, maybe I've been getting it wrong. I, well, I, I, just, I am I, from I, Arizona, I don't know. I don't, so wow. I don't know wow. anything so, about so pearls seafood, or oysters. So a big, a big <laughs> seafood guy is what you're saying. I, uh, I don't uh, anything that looks like a booger. I don't eat anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> oysters, I just never, I just never, I just, I always, you know, I'm a, a tactile guy. To like that's not that's something that comes out of you, not something you put in you. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. It's so slimy and gross. Maybe I, I should have done the so, metaphor as like a desert thing. Like we found the water in the cactus. That's more my home go. turf. That's that's, that's, that's okay. better. That's better. So I'm gonna be there in Phoenix, man. Next week, all new show. Uh, zero side effects. It's uh, I think it's gonna it's really good. And I tell a near death story in it that I had a near death experience uh, at the dentist uh, that changed my entire life. And that's that's part of the show. Oh my god wow i am super excited and and guess what all you listeners if you're curious and especially the phoenician ones links are going to be in the show notes not buried like the water in the arizona soil it's going to be right up at the surface you can just click there you can just use your thumb you can be you you can shut you're amping up your metaphor game i like yeah yeah. Uh, yeah, I like. Well, oh, thanks man. for having me on, man. I, I hope it was all right. Thanks for listening to me babble. I appreciate it. And that's the end of the episode. What a fantastic one. One of my favorites. In fact, Christopher Titus, a gem, if you will, a true treasure. Speaking of treasure, don't forget the Trash or Treasure show. Don't forget Christopher Titus in Phoenix. All those links are going to be in the show notes. Show us all some love. I'll show you some love in return. Oh, my gosh. Speaking of, I do have to give some shout outs. Kim. Thank you, Kim, for all the love and all the comments that you leave on YouTube. And I wanted to give my Aunt Rose a big thank you. My Aunt Rose has been awesome. I went over to go see her the other day, and she's just been a true, a true ruby in my life. She, her favorite color is red, so I had to choose a gem that is red colored. And she's just been awesome. She's supported me so much, and she listened to one of the episodes. And, and She listened to a lot of episodes, but she told me she listened to the last episode. She really liked it, the chemistry with me and Lamar, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I was just so, so touched. You guys should get yourselves an Aunt Rose if you haven't already. But she's awesome. And thank you for all of you guys that have left me DMs, uh, talked to me in person, commented, all that stuff. It's true. Uh, it's like a raindrop and, you know, just one raindrop is boring, but if you have multiple raindrops, you get rain and it's, I am wet with all of you guys' love. It just got me soaked, I'm dousing wet. And thank you guys so much. Thank you. Millions. Love you guys. Big old gooch smooch. Ciao.